Good morning. Welcome to our worship here at Ridgecrest United Methodist Church in the high desert of California on June 21st in the year 2020. And a happy and blessed Father's Day to all those fathers out there. I'm joined this morning by our music team of uh, Amber Peterson as our soloist and singer. We have Chloe Krauss on piano who's uh, subbing for Patrick Rent. We have Heider, Heidi Miller Costanzo and on flute and Ted Fisk uh, on guitar. I invite you to follow the order of worship and the song lyrics that were sent out or posted also on our Facebook page and to uh, sing along. Also, if you have any prayer requests that you would like to be shared and lifted up, you can also send those in and post those in the com comments on our Facebook live feed. So bow with me in prayer this morning as we begin our worship service. Loving teacher, O oh God, you come and you enter our hearts. We ask that you make your, our, your home in our hearts this day. We pray that you would dwell within us all day long, that you would save us from error or foolish ways, that you would teach us this day to do no harm, to do good, and to assist us so that we may stay in loving relationship with you and our neighbor. Help us today to be an answer to another's prayer so that we may be one of your signs of hope in the world you love. Amen. So this is week two of a sermon series on three simple rules, a Wesleyan way of living. And this is a little booklet 
that is part of this series by uh, Reuben Job. And these words are drawn from John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. And I'll talk more about that later, but uh, here's John. And just like last week, and so John Wesley watches uh, over all of us Methodist preachers. So he's going to be right here. He'll be by those live, fresh flowers that are placed on the altar this morning by uh, Linda Miller in honor of of all loved ones. Um, And so we thank Linda for that gift as well. So three scriptures, all short and, and all very similar. The first one comes from 3 John. And so there's three short books of John, not the Gospel of John, near the end of the Bible. Um, and 3 John has no chapter. It only has one chapter. So that's why it's listed as just verse 11, and in this case, 11a and b. So, beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but imitate what is good. Whoever does good is from God. In Romans 12, 9 to 10, let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. And then the Gospel of Luke, words from Jesus in chapter 6, verse 27 and 28. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In Jesus' ministry, we are told in the Gospel of Acts that as the apostles relate about Jesus Christ that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power and he went about doing good, which is the model for us as well. It is the model that John Wesley developed when he formed his general societies in England in the 1700s and formed class meetings of laity who were seeking and were drawn in by the message of the good news that John Wesley and other preachers were spreading throughout that time. He organized these small groups, and as part of the organization, he gave them three general rules to live out their daily walk with Christ. Bishop Job, in our time, wrote his book to expand upon those three simple rules and try to draw them out and flesh them out, that even though they were written centuries ago by John Wesley, how might that look like in our modern time. So he took the blueprint that John Wesley taught and he he fleshed it out and he's passed it on to us. John Wesley's rules believed that everyone needed help living a holy and good life. And in his time, there were situations and circumstances in which in society there was unrest and upheaval And there were people concerned not only for their salvation, but concerned about what was happening in the world around them as well. Wesley believed that if we practice disciplined practices, that we could follow better in the footsteps of Christ. And so he wrote his second rule. The first rule is do no harm. But the second rule is by doing good, by being in every kind merciful after their power, and as they have opportunity, doing good of every possible sort and as far as possible to all persons. Now these three general rules as written by John Wesley can be found in our United Methodist Book of Discipline and they're expounded upon there a little more. And I want to highlight some of those After Wesley notes the basis of that rule, he says, 
we do this, one, to the bodies, which the ability which God gives, and by that he said, we give food to the hungry, we clothe the naked, we visit or help those that are sick in prison, which if it sounds biblical, it is. And then he said, we, to the souls, or we might say in our world today, to our spirits, by instructing, reproving, and exhorting all that we have intercourse with, meaning all that we interact with, by trampling underfoot any enthusiastic doctrine that we are not to do good unless our hearts be free to it, but that we do good especially to those of the household of faith or those who are groaning to be so, in other words, seekers, and that Wesley noted that we should employ them preferably to others, that we should buy from them compared to others, that we should help each other, meaning other Christians in business, and so much more so because what he saw in his day was is that the world at large, including Christians and non-Christians, but that the world at large would tend to take care of its own, but that we in our Christian faith should make sure that we reach out and support those who are others in the faith. And that by all possible diligence and frugality, the gospel may not be blamed, but by run with patience the race that is set before them, deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, submit ourselves to bear the reproach of Christ. And then he gives some harsh words. He says that we would be the filth and the offscoring of the world, that we would look so that men would say all kinds of manners of evil of us falsely, all in the Lord's sake. And so these are the rules that Wesley gave. And I notice how he says we do good to the bodies, the physical ways we do good by giving food, but we also need to do good to our spirits and our souls in this way. Last week I talked about do no harm, and we might think that it's just enough if we can learn to train ourselves from causing evil by not letting what we do or say extend from ourselves. But as admirable as that is, we actually need to do more beyond that step. And so we may think, well, do good. What does that mean? It's simple. But where do I begin Are there limits to that? Are there boundaries? And what does doing good look like in a divided, hostile, and wounded world? Wesley noted in his journal once that there is scarce any possible way of doing good for which there is not daily occasion. It is always there. So this doing good is a universal command, and it's not limited, even though Wesley indicated we should first focus on other brothers and sisters in Christ, But it's not limited to those as well. Doing good is a proactive way of living so that I do not need to wait for others to come to me and ask for help, but I can seek those out. I can learn to open my eyes to see what is going on in the world around me and ask the question, can I do some good in this way? Reuben Job, in his little booklet of Three Simple Rules, notes that there might be some objections to this that we might come up with and we might say, wait a second, aren't there, shouldn't be there some limitations? And so one objection he notes is that it could get out of control and I could get, end up giving all my things away and even my whole life away. So shouldn't I set limits on doing good? So get out of control makes me think how many things in our life do we see that are out of control but when does that actually happen to us but how often do we see things get out of control in the field in the area of generosity and doing good you know we may be the ones that want to place the limits on doing good because we may find it's too hard to change our training to be careful We don't want to watch out about what we got to do. 
getting out of control. But how often does God get out of control with God's love and goodness and generosity? In the book of Acts that tells the story of those first evangelistic efforts, Pentecost came. Pentecost with the Holy Spirit coming and all those people gathered in Jerusalem. That was God getting out of control. And we can read in the Bible in the New Testament what the effect of that was. But then think also in your own life. How has God gotten out of control in your own life by being generous and good and kind and loving? And do we really want to say, God, would you please limit yourself? Would you please hold yourself back? Don't get out of control, God. I I want you to stop and control your goodness, especially as it relates to us. If we are going to err, maybe we should err on the side of generosity, err on the side of doing good. Another objection that Job notes is, is, what if I offer my gift of goodness, whether it be small or large, and it's not appreciated or it's ridiculed or even worse, it's rejected? Or what if my efforts are seen as weakness or perhaps even they are accepted and then misused in ways that are repulsive to me? That's a good objection. One of the things that's taken place in these last few weeks has been the highlighting of particular deaths, murders really, of black persons in this country. And so there's been a rising up of protest. And one of the things that you may have seen with this regard is a saying called Black Lives Matter. And I know that there are other persons who say, whoa, all lives matter. Well, there's no disagreement with that, and there's no disagreement with both. And I admit that I have been influenced and changed to understand more what black lives matter as opposed to settling for all lives matter. One of the things that did that for me recently was a meme on Facebook. I know, something good that came out of Facebook. (laughs) But this was a meme that helped me change my own subtle internal bias and pushed me in a direction of understanding and of doing good. And this is what the meme said. It said, And I quote, the father was waiting there with a big sign, hashtag, prodigal sons matter. When the older brother saw it, he was angry, wouldn't attend the party, and moped around with his own sign, hashtag, all sons matter. Father, dude, it's not about you right now. And so, in the story of the prodigal son or the forgiving father, the older son rejected the outreach of love to the younger son. He saw it as favoritism. But the one thing that the parable, that parable teaches us is that while God's love may be focused at times, it's not limited. In God's kingdom, there is not one large pot of goodness and love and mercy. And God doesn't reach into that pot and dole it out and give goodness and love and mercy and look in the pot and go, hmm, there's not enough, so I can't give you any today. I can only give to this person over here, but none to you. That's not the way God operates. That's not God's theology. And that shouldn't be our theology as well when we understand goodness and love. So when we operate in this way, when we operate following God, believing that there is this abundance of goodness and love that we can extend to the world and that we can choose to extend it to particular peoples or particular areas or particular efforts at one time, Recognize, as in the story, the parable of the prodigal son, that there may be pushback to you on that. But don't 
let that stop you from continuing to reach out. And I'll give you my confession. I know in my own life, as I reflect on that, that I have given pushback to others who are operating out of the abundance of goodness and love and mercy. And I plead guilty to that. But also plead open to being willing to change and to see and to know that I can give and that I can give in a way that may be particular at this point in time. And that is not any limits or restriction for how it can be given in other times. Doing good is a challenging way to live. Scripture is clear that a life dedicated to loving God and neighbor was never declared as easy. It is a way of life that is a radical departure from what we normally see in the world. But to walk with Jesus and act like Jesus does means that we are focusing on something larger than ourselves. We're focusing on someone larger than any human being or organization. Another objection to doing good means that all this focus on doing good to others, does that deny my own health and well-being? Well, taking appropriate care of self and living selfishly are not opposites. They are each essential elements of a healthy and productive life. And to love God with all of life and to love neighbor as a self does not denigrate, deny, or devalue myself, but is to proclaim the heart of our theology as Christians that we too can see the other person as God sees the other person. That the other person is the apple of God's eye. That the other person is ultimately safe in the strong arms of God and that I too follow in the same way. And finally, there's the objection that, well, can't I do good and not be a Christian? And of course, the answer is yes. In fact, sometimes the best goodness we see in the world comes from people who do not claim themselves to be Christians. But this is also true. It's hard to be a Christian and not do good because the very nature of who a Christian is involves doing good and being good. If we set our standard just to be good, we may succeed and do quite well, but there are two difficulties with this type of life. The first, of course, is that no one can ever be good all the time. We're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fail in our thoughts and our words and our deeds. And the second is, is that a life of goodness is truly not complete without God in our lives. Living our lives as God wants us to becomes the why of our life. And hopefully we will become aware that we are created not just to do, but to reflect the very imprint of God, the very being of God. God has made that aware in our very bodies and ourselves because we are created that way. But our being of who we are and our why is far greater than just helping somebody out with our favorite charity or practicing good behavior. We are called by God to reflect God's love, not just be helpful and decent, but to be mirrors of a higher power that we know in name as God. You may have heard me say, or you may have seen me write this. It's from the Bible. In 1 John, that other group of little books, Aloha Keakua, which is just the Hawaiian translation for God is love. Because God first loved us and shows us his love to us continually, we in turn pass that love on to others. So doing good is not just some nice thing that we do to feel good inside, which it often does, nor it's something we do to score brownie points for heaven, which is in its own self a debatable issue. But doing good is an indicator of how we are to live our lives as Christians. Doing good does enable healing. And sometimes the healing that it enables 
is not just for the other person that is a recipient of our doing good. Sometimes the healing is for us as well in that act. Listen to John Wesley's words again. His servant I am, and as such I am employed according to the plain direction of his word. As I have opportunity doing good unto all men. And his providence clearly concurs with his word, which has disengaged me from all else, from all things else, that I might singly attend on this very thing. Doing good. The, the pastor and writer, Glenn Henson, writes about what it means to do good as a peacemaker in the world. And he cites Mother Teresa of India. You may remember Mother Teresa. She died back in the late, the late 90s. When she was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1979, there was some criticism, the Nobel Peace Prize, let me be clear. There was some criticism because she did not fit the normal category of her people in doing large-scale peace efforts. For example, past awardees were world leaders who would help negotiate truces between warring nations. That's not what she did. When she spoke about this, she said that was fine with her because she saw herself as a one-on-one -on -one person, which is also interesting because she was also quite abrupt at times and brash and, and perhaps even coarse or crude in her dealings. She would never win an award for being warm and fuzzy. But she said, I never look at the masses as my responsibility. I only look at the individual. I can only love one person at a time. I can only feed one person at a time, just one. You get closer to Christ by coming closer to each other. As Jesus said, whatever you do for the least of my brethren, you do it for me. So you begin. I begin, she says. She said the whole work is only a drop in the ocean. But if we don't put that drop in, the ocean would be one drop less. Same thing for you, same thing in your family, same thing in your church, where you go. Just begin. One, one, one. And so Mother Teresa threw herself in to the task of doing good in the microcosm, and she trusted God that her small efforts would be something. She didn't let the apparent insignificance of what she was doing overwhelm her and render her useless. As she also reflected and said, she said, God is all. I do nothing on my own. He does it. This is what I am. God's pencil, a tiny bit of pencil with what he writes, what he likes, doing good. Bow with me in prayer. Oh, holy God, this day encourage us and lift us up. Change our understanding of who we are so that we in turn can live out your understanding of what love is for others. Amen.
I invite you at this time to pause wherever you are and join in a spirit of prayer that you would settle into a moment of stillness as we enter into this time and we share. We want to lift up some of our prayer requests, some that you've sent in. Continued prayers for Julie Gervais dealing with throat cancer who had surgery um, and will be starting radiation treatment in the coming uh, weeks, next several weeks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prayers uh, from Reed Baker asking for prayers for her stepdaughter, Lizzie Lamb, who is at the emergency room with a possible broken leg. So prayers for healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And continued prayers for Mike Herr's sister, Kathy, um, for healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I invite you, as we go to God in prayer, to begin with a moment of silent prayer, and then following the pastoral prayer, that you would join with me wherever you are in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, enlarge my heart that it may be big enough to receive the greatness of your love. Stretch my heart that it may take into it all those who with me around the world believe in Jesus Christ. Stretch my heart that it may take into it all those who do not know him, but who are my responsibility because I know him. And stretch it that it may take in all those who are not lovely in my eyes and whose hands I do not want to touch, but whom Jesus touches. And so, Lord, enlarge our hearts that we might do your goodness in the world, a goodness driven not by our own desire, but driven by the engine, by the power that is you within us. Even so that we may do such acts and we may not even realize it. Even so that we may do such acts and we may even wonder at what we just did. We pray that these acts might be acts extended through our act of praying not only for those whom we've named here, but those whom we know on our own prayer list, those whom you will place upon our hearts in the coming week. May our acts of love and goodness be combined with the acts of love and goodness of others, that together we may build up and contribute to something larger than ourselves. And we may do something that is a step forward in your kingdom for all those that are in pain and suffering and hurt, whether it be physically of the body, whether it be mentally of the mind, whether it be emotionally of the spirit. We pray that you would reach out and touch them. We pray for those who are in positions of leadership that they may be empowered to do the good for the people under their charge and care and that they may be protected, that you would place a shield around them from all the, the slings and arrows of criticism that so often and will come in doing so. And Lord, enable us to be faithful to you as we are faithful now by praying this prayer together. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For those of you that have been following us all this time, we know we have an offering, and even though we're not collecting an offering in our, in our worship space this morning, but the offering is one monetary. And you know what's great is, is that if you have money, then that's a most excellent way that you can do good. And I know those who are part of our congregation here do that in great abundance in outreach and charity. And so thank you for that. And thank you also because that same goodness, remember there's not a limit on the pot, can be extended in other efforts here in our community, or our nation, or our world, through other means beyond this church. And so thank you for that, for doing that good. If you need some specific ways to do that, you can find that on our church Facebook page about how to give in the ministries of this church um, or how you can give and outreach for some of those missionaries beyond. Our announcements are these, of course, for Father's Day. We uh, celebrate that, but also note that there is a, um, a little booklet. It's also, I believe, on our slide screen here. And this little booklet is... Here at the church office, we're also placing it in the little library that is on Felspar Street, which is the street that the church is on, by our church sign. And you can get a copy there. You can also get a copy at the church office or by calling the church and saying, you know, I can't drive or can't get to Felspar Little Library, and we'll make arrangements to, to get it dropped off to you with appropriate social distancing in that way. Uh, the Midweek Kids program continues this week, the final uh, week in June, and it's a stuffed animal overnight. If you drop your toys off at the social hall on Wednesday between 11 a.m. and 12 noon, they will spend the night, and they will have a reading, I believe, and then the next day you can come back between 11 a.m., 12 noon, and Thursday and pick up those stuffed animals as well. Just a note, this sermon series continues. Last, or next week is the, the final week, Stay in Love with God. And then our upper room uh, suppers uh, continue as well. And let me also add that uh, speaking of upper room, there's a devotional called the Upper Room Devotional that's put out by our United Methodist Church. And the July-August issues have come in. And so if you would like those, contact the church office either to pick them up or we'll get them uh, sent to you are delivered to you as well. So go forth this week in God's blessing and go forth as we sing our closing hymn and then our closing song.
be blessed, receive the benediction with believing hearts. In the name of God, who is the Father who gives goodness. In the name of God, who is the Christ who lived goodness and lives goodness. In the name of God, the Holy Spirit, who empowers us to do goodness. Amen. Thank you.